before um, starting, I guess I should say, obviously this is the second webinar, um, and I'm not entirely sure about the attendance, whether many people were here last time, um, here this time, or vice versa. Um, so forgive me in advance, there will be some level of repetition, because of course I need to really sort of go through the, the nuts and bolts for people who are joining for the first time. Um, so the structure will be very similar to the last presentation. However, at the end, I've added a lot of slides around the feedback that I've received so far and the issues that are perhaps are causing issues. Um, at what point? I'll, at which point I will, I guess, open things up to a question and answer session. Um, so yeah, forgive me in advance if you've seen this before. You may have seen it before if you were here last Tuesday. Okay, so I guess. As always, with a good presentation, a little bit of background first. Um, as we know, um, or I hope we all know, um, bus operators uh, are required to publish their fares ticketing using the UK NetEx profile. Um, and we know that NetEx is very new to the UK public transport industry um, and is a very sort of flexible uh, modular data standard, um, which means you can do lots of great things with it, but of course, um, brings its own challenges um, in that what we're finding is that first data being published is coming with lots of different structures, large variations in content because most of the NetEx standard um, is non-mandatory effectively. Um, so you can submit very little if you want or quite a lot um, depending on circumstance. So to address this, the Bus Open Data Service is implemented a more restricted profile. Um, which now covers both simple and complex fares. Um, you know, the main the main aims of this profile are to sort of bring great standardization to the first which is being published um, to ensure a minimum level of content um, for each product, um, which will obviously improve the sort of detail available to downstream users, the downstream users, and hopefully drive take up of the data, which is obviously what we're all here for. Um, and then Thirdly, to establish a standardised mechanism for referencing external data sets, because of course any fair product needs to define what kind of access it gives you, and you can only do that through referencing um, stops and services. So obviously we need to reference NAPTAN and BODS. So we're, we describe in the profile a specific way of doing that. So where we are with the documentation at the moment, the documentation that's available that you'll, well, I mean, I'm hoping you all have seen is version 0.4. Um, it's version 0 0.4 because we've already gone through a very limited um, consultation, sort of internal to BODS um, and with some of the major ETM suppliers and with TIM. Um, so that's why we're at version 4 already. There's already been a lot of feedback and changes made. Um, obviously, we know that the documentation is very complicated. It's very technical. Uh, I think some operators have complained about the sort of jargonistic uh, approach that BODS takes. I mean, I think we're sort of hamstrung by the data standards themselves. We inherently need to be technical um, at some at some point, but I know there's a lot of operators on this call. Um, so just to sort of say, while this profile document will inherently be a technical document, um, and may be difficult to understand for people new to NetEx, we will be issuing um, a sort of beginner's guide type document, um, which will come out with the final profile to help operators better understand what it means for them. Um, and then also we'll be um, sort of publishing some use cases around popular product types just to sort of um, help people but to both create the data and consume the data to encourage better understanding. Uh, we take the timeline of consultation so as has been said we've already had um, one webinar that was last Tuesday the 20th uh, this is the second one the 29th. Um, we have until March the 6th um that's the closing date for feedback um and there'll be a two-week turnaround um where all the feedback is i guess assessed and um amendments are made to the final profile document accordingly um and then sometime after easter where date to be confirmed because obviously we've got easter and things like that coming up so we need to be we need to be doing it when i guess that that kind of press and the school holidays are over so there'll be a final webinar to, to talk through the final profile um, and all the amendments and why we've made the decisions we've made. Um, and just to quickly go back to what I said earlier, um, you know, as we've said, um, NetEx, in order to be 
really valuable needs to essentially reference um, external data sources. Uh, the UK profile netex does allow you to actually define basic route and, route and timetable data, um, but to keep things simple, rather than have most of that defined in a netex file, we've kept it as light touch as possible uh, and refer to bolts trans exchange um, and nap and stop data uh, for the sort of richness that's needed for passenger information. Um, so there's two sort of key points that need need remembering, and that is that you know where you are defining lines or services that you need to use um, line IDs as established in the trans exchange PTI profile, um, and then stops almost always need to be entered in the NAPTAN database and use the ACO code. Um, exceptions are allowed to that um, in the net, NETEC standard um, and follow the kind of precedent established in the trans exchange PTI profile. Um, so I'm quickly, I've got quite a long section on NETEC structure and content. I'm going to speed this one up a bit. Um, I went into it in quite a lot of detail last time. Um, and that video is all already available um, on the PTIC website and this presentation is available on the PTIC website. So um, for brev brevity's sake, I'm going to just sort of skim over the things um, and uh, try and explain, I guess, what it means for operators. Um, and then we'll get onto the feedback section. So one of the things that we talk about in the profile we're, we're sort of mandating is uh, a certain approach to file structure um, because NetEx is extremely flexible allows you to um, spread um, products across multiple XML files or conversely include everything in one single XML file. Um, so what we're doing is basically saying that all, all, all elements relevant to any fair product must be within the single XML file um, and that generally a one file per product uh, structure is, is encouraged, um, but we do allow for larger files uh, with multiple products in, although we recommend that that is only in cases where you've got a lot of past type products, network wide products that you can put in the same file. Um, there was feedback about this, um, so we'll get to that later. I'll just press on. Um, frames, I think this is not really relevant to bus operators. You kind of expect this is what your, your system supplier should be resolving for you, but we, we define, I guess, the frames. There's something in um, NetEx called a version frame, which is a container to group other types of elements together. We specify all the different frames that need to be included in a file published to BODS. Uh, so like I say, in terms of what this means for operators, that's for your system supplier to, to address. This isn't something that you'll be able to affect yourselves. Versioning. Um, what, I mean, for, for those who are, I guess, familiar, obviously there is versioning in trans exchange, um, and I guess it's been, slightly contentious and difficult to implement. Um, I won't dip into that controversy here, but I think, you know, from, from a consumption perspective and a management perspective, version control is very valuable. Um, and I guess it's something that we would like to see. However, the unregulated nature of fair products um, means that it's very difficult to implement um in a consistent basis on bods so we do have a recommended approach to versioning um and we do encourage system suppliers and will be working with system suppliers to implement this but at the moment it will not be mandatory and what we're asking is the operators themselves focus on how they're publishing data and making sure that when they publish new fares data that the old data is end dated or made inactive to ensure that there isn't any um confusion uh, all the data that's published on bots. Uh, we can return to versioning later as well in the feedback section, I think. Um, in terms of the network, so again, like I said earlier, you know, for the um, for the first data to work, it needs to reference the network, what we call the network. And when we say the network, we mean routes and their operators and stops. So as I said earlier, operators, you know, they need to be referenced by the same national operator code that you're using on your trans exchange. Line IDs need to be lit, the same line IDs that are in the trans exchange files that are published for the for the routes that the product gives access to, and stops need to be NAPTAN points, or where there isn't one in NAPTAN, um, you can include a temporary stop um, that's in the equivalent trans exchange file. Um, so yeah, I mean that's pretty straightforward. I think 
this is one of the things that will probably trip operators up, um, but we will get to that in the feedback section. Um, tariff. So most of this is really around the variables of any specific fair product, you know, the structure of it. Um, most of it will not be in the operator's control. Um, most of this will be written um, to the file by your system supplier, so it's your system supplier's responsibility to, to address. However, there are certain things um, such as tariff basis, which may be a result of, you know, your own entry that if you are, you know, depending on how you're maintaining your fares in your ETMs, you know, perhaps you might be using a fair triangle and having the same price in each cell for past products or single products. These kind of things will end up throwing up errors. So I think it's important that um, I guess operators are defining their fares correctly uh, in their ETM. But I think most of this will actually be the responsibility of your system supplier to address. So the first structure elements, which are part of the tariff, again, we, we have certain types which are mandatory and certain types which are uh, mandatory under certain conditions. Um, so past type products um, must have durations. Um, Carnets must have certain elements in to define the number of units and groups. Group tickets need an additional element as well, but the core ones are around access. So really that's, that's your ticket machine supplier's responsibility to sort. There is eligibility, so this is around your passenger times. So this is another thing that can trip um, operators up. I think that all suppliers now have ways for you to define the rules around your passenger types. Um, so you should do that where it's possible because otherwise it will throw, throw up validation errors. And that includes things for you know child and young person tickets that you should be defining age ranges and what that means because at the moment you know you the, the, the passenger type um is something that is often missing um from fair products published to pods um so in terms of the fair products i mean this is very technical stuff and really isn't isn't addressed for operators but a pre-assigned fair product is what's used to wrap up all the structure and network elements for a traditional product Something called an amount of price unit products is used for carnets and other bundle products. And then we have something called a cap discount right, which is to define caps. So this is really for the system suppliers themselves, the ticket machine suppliers, um, to make sure that this, this structure is being followed um, as mandated by the profile. Um, it covers both simple products. And as we said with a cap, we're talking about tap and go type products, post paid products, and um, if you have them. Sales of a package. This again is mainly for your system supplier to resolve for you, but it includes things, you know, where a ticket can be bought, um, how you can pay for it, and what kind of media it comes on. You know, is it is it an app or is it a paper ticket, etc. So it's those kind of things. Um, so those are all mandated um, by the profile. And then we have something called fair prices, which is where prices are attached to to products. Um, We've tried to keep this as simple as possible. This is touched on in the feedback. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but at the moment it's quite a light touch approach. Um, really, we're only looking for for past type products. We're looking for the fair products and sales of a package to be priced in combination. So that's the product itself, and then the way you can be, buy it. Because of course, you know, um, products don't have prices in isolation. They may have different prices depending on how you buy it. You know, paper ticket bought on vehicle might be more expensive than one bought on an app or whatever. Um, and then we expect things like distance matrix elements to be priced. Uh, that's for point to point fares, the traditional kind of fair triangle. Um, and then we also expect um, the cap discount right where included to be priced. Um, so that's really basically defining um, the capping limits, um, a cap discount right. Um, in, includes like sub elements called capping price rules, which is where you define the length of time of the cap and these kind of things. So you can include a price for a one day cap and a seven day cap, etc. You can also define, you know, the, the business rules around that. Perhaps if it starts, you know, week caps are applied from the first moment of travel or whether they're uh, applied from a, a set week, you know, caps applied Monday through to Sunday, something like that. You can define all of those things in capping price rules. Um, so yeah, the profile defines that as well. Um, and one thing it also says is, it, it, even though the legislation talks around um, discounted prices being a complex fare, what we're asking for is not um, 
discounts expressed explicitly as discounts. We want prices to be absolute numbers, pounds and pence. What we don't want to see is a child is 50% of an adult um, because obviously that can cause, well, I mean, it has the opportunity to cause confusion to downstream consumers, particularly if 50% is not a round number, these kind of things. So we'd rather stick to um, absolute numbers of price um, paid by a passenger. So I've gone through that very quickly. Um, I'm just stopping for questions uh, before we get into the, the feedback section that I've received so far. Does, it, does anybody have uh, any questions about anything that I've just said? Uh, I've put links to um, the last recording, which goes through that much more slowly um, in the chat and the link to the slide deck from last time. Um, so um, if this is your first session, then uh, you can recap um, and, uh, and hear what Stephen said first time round. So I'll take the um, silence as there being no questions at this point. Um, I'm going to go back to the uh, feedback that I've received so far. Um, I assume I'm broadcasting again. OK, so um, I have received a few emails. Uh, thank you to everybody who has replied. Um, I've not responded to all the feedback emails I've received so far. I will respond to every single person um, directly with comments on their feedback. But um, at this point, I've just bundled up what seem to be the most important points um, in a series of slides that I guess uh, I'd like to go through. I think this one is the first one because I think this is probably one of the more contentious ones, particularly for operators themselves, um, because this is one of the most common errors thrown up in the validation process at the moment. Um, so I think that if we are going to bring in a hard block for um, uh, non-valid fares, which is something that's scheduled for later in 2020, 2024, Q4, I think, um, then this is something that needs to be addressed. So the, the first point is around fare stages. Um, so the NetX profile that we've defined uh, requires that all fare zones contain at least one stop. Um, now, a fare zone it has multiple uses in NetX, um, but in this context, really, we're talking about a representation of a fare stage along a linear route. Um, the reason why we're insisting on every fare zone, including one stop point, is that um, you know the data is ultimately intended for customer information, and that prices should reflect where a passenger can board and alight a service. Um, so if we've got you know, fare zone A to fare zone, fare zone B, um, there needs to be a stop in each fare zone for that journey to be achievable by the passenger. Um, a, a fare zone without a stop means that we're essentially saying there's a price between a point where you can get on, but then a point where you can't get off. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the reasoning behind the data. I mean, I think this is something that I know there's probably some operators on the call that might have some comments now. It is understood there are obviously legitimate scenarios um, where in an ETM you may not have um, a stop in a fair stage. Um, that could be that there isn't a stop in nap time that's appropriate, correct entry. That could be because the operator and the LTA are disagreeing on whether they should be stopping there or other such things around that. Um, or it could be due to the complex nature of the route, whether it's you know a clover leaf or you know whatever kind of structures we have. I think what we're trying to say here is, and this is something that I do plan to add to the document, um, is that scenarios where you can't include a stop in a fare zone should be addressed um, not by relaxing the profile, but actually it should be addressed by either removing the fare zone from the data that's being produced in NetEx, or that a non nap time scheduled stop point is included. Um, to address this issue. I mean, I think in the latter case, that should only be seen as a temporary solution um, and should always be, as I said earlier, a stop that's included in the equivalent trans exchange files um, for a service. Um, so really what we're talking about there is stops that aren't in NAPTAN um, for whatever reason. Um, 
So I think that's my statement on this. That's our statement on this. Um, I know that the, I, I think I saw a couple of operators on who've had comments about this before. Does it? Does, does anybody want to raise a challenge to this or question this? Ivan, you were the, exactly the man that I was actually thinking of when I said I need the operators on. I'm going to stop sharing yeah, no. for a sec because I'm struggling to. Uh, but yeah, Simon. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think I think I had a call with somebody before, was before, but, but there's loads of well, certainly the way we manage our data within you know ticket tool that we use. If you create a route with fair stages, those fair stages exist in both directions. There's no control that we have over that. However, stops may not exist for those in both directions. For instance, if you have a terminal loop at the end of a route, it might have stops on the inbound, but it doesn't have stops on the outbound because it only gets served, those fair stages only get served inbound. You also get cases where you, there just isn't a stop in the other direction. Um, so the first stage unit does only exist in one direction, um, and in some cases we you know, have routes that can go on to a passenger may board and be able to pay for a fare that then allows them onto another route. So we may include fare stages for that other route so that we can give a fare, but there are no stops that are applicable to the route that's issuing the fare on the through fare. If that makes sense. So in that case. Where you're offering the through fare to that fare stage wouldn't necessarily include stops in it so there's a sort of there's a whole host of reasons why there wouldn't be stops within fare stages okay so yeah i mean that's these are both i guess scenarios where you know your business use case is not the same as i guess the use case for legitimate information for a passenger downstream using this data i think the former scenario um, where you're talking about fare zones being in both directions, I think that that is ultimately an issue with the data being written to NetEx. That ultimately the fare zone in the opposite direction that doesn't have a stop simply should not be included. So you would say that was for our, effectively, our data is provided through tickets. So it would be for them to remove that fare zone in the opposite direction if it didn't include a first stage. Yes. And I think that in the latter Sorry, case. Stop. In the latter case, there is actually a section in the profile about three fares saying that you need to include both lines for a three fare um, and the fair the fair stages for them. Um, so that, that three is, fare, so that three fare may be onto a route that's not even operated by ourselves. So that would become a multi operator fare. Yeah. So how would that work? Well, so this is something that's meant to have been addressed by the OPDI um, that through fares, but basically anything that's counted as a multi operator fare. Um, the major bus operators agreed to an approach where they would, in, in each area um, or for each product type, um, the bus operator, the major bus operator would take responsibility for supplying the data on behalf of every other operator. Um, so I think that if your through fares are for service from another operator that's one of the big operators, that actually they have verbally agreed to take on the responsibility for providing that fares data on your behalf. This is quite a complicated um, mm. issue, but I think that for multi-operator fares, and it's a through fare as well, um, you should probably leave them out for the time being. Your data, while the issue of the supply of multi-operator fares is addressed by the big operators generally, um, I think that by agreeing to the approach that the big operators advocated for multi-operator fares, we found ourselves with a bit of a problem for kind of the more obscure um, single trip fares, like the ones you're describing. I mean. What operators do you tend to have these through fares with, these, these agreements with, and how are well, they agreed? Well, in this particular case that I'm thinking of, it's actually theoretical because it's it's something we used to do and it's something we could do in the future. So we did used to have a, a, a through fare with Stagecoach um, where we operated one end of a route and they they, they think it was a sort of, it pre, before we operated it, they they 
they ran a longer version of the route. So we continue to have through fares so you can get off the bus and get onto their service. So that doesn't exist in our data at the moment, but something like that could exist in the future. We do, at the moment, for through fares, we do have them, but they'd be our own services. But yeah. then that so can I get complicated if, if you know, if you're saying you've got, if you've got a through fare that could go off in many different directions, you've got to have the stops for every route that it could possibly go on in that route. Sort of seems unmanageable, to be honest. It's difficult, yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's the issue with all multi-operator fares in the moment. We there is no approach for addressing this that doesn't require a certain level of coordination between all of the operators involved. Um, even if we were to separate them out, we would still need indicators across data sets that could be followed, and those would need to be, you know, coordinated on an ongoing basis. So there is no scenario where we can get multi-operator fares data. Um, and it actually give an accurate representation of what rights that product gives you without bus operators either coordinating with each other or supplying data for other people's services. That's the only way it can be addressed logically. So I think that for your theoretical case, I think that probably needs some more thought because it is a very unusual and difficult scenario. I think that for your own services, for a through fare, you should be defining the access rights fully that a product gives. Um, so that means including all the lines that it allows through travel for. Um, Your question then is how? <laughs> That's the, it's obviously, we're, we're programming our our fare through ticketer you program your fares within a line how do you then link that to another line well this is the same challenge as the so, multi yeah. fares you know there yeah. is there is what your system does at the moment yeah for, for the retailer tickets which has always met your needs and then there is obviously the obligations or, or the requirement of the data to be something that's actually usable downstream mm. to give an accurate reflection of mm. what price is paid and what rights you get with that price. Um, and I think that, yeah, the legislation is written in such a way that it ultimately puts quite a burden on um, operators to provide this data. Yeah, I think the, the, the where the issue is, is because we've got the system as it cur we've currently got it, and the limitations of what we got, and we have to, we currently have these through fares, so they are coded in our system, but we've had data rejected from bods because of these elements that are missing that when we so we're sort of stuck in a place where we can't fix it. Yeah. I mean I and guess we we'll the, 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 yeah, the other direction. I mean, I could see uh, Andy Leon's face on the cameras, uh, but I'm sure there are other people that consume data. In terms of through fares, I mean, are these the kind of fares that you would ever use? Um, and how would you expect to see what 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 level of granularity would you expect to see in the definition of a through fare? Um, yeah, I mean it's not something we've we've really looked at yet. Um, we're we're obviously aware of it, but uh, yeah, in order to um, uh, in order to be able to provide a through fare, we we do need that additional information of where you can get through to. Um, so it's the same. Uh, it's the same in that sense. We we need the access rights at, at, at both ends, uh, regardless of whether that is a change of line or or anything. We need to be able to reference uh, or to treat that as a as a whole journey from one stop to a to another stop. Um, so we we got here from from uh, I believe from uh, from empty fair stages. Um, so I. I guess my question is: Is how does an empty fair stage help your situation, Simon? In in modelling that data, is that just is it essentially just a placeholder? Um, no, well, so it, me it means the driver can issue a fare because the driver yeah. on the ticket machine would set that the destination fair stage to the des you know the fair it doesn't need a stop in it. That they know that yeah. they're selling a ticket through to wherever that's on another service, and that just allows them to offer that fare. So it doesn't require yeah. a bus stop for the driver and for us to issue a fare. Yeah. Well, I think you know ultimately this is 
a problem with I mean most of the problems we we encounter are the, basically summed up as what you require to sell a ticket is not what you require to define where you can get off of that ticket you know the full rights of the ticket so this is the problem that we keep kind of coming back to around multi operator multi operator fares three fares even passenger types you don't need to know how old a child is to sell a child ticket just the driver needs to know that so mm -hmm. this is this is essentially the, the the root of all the issues that we we face i think that you know i've i've def i've written things from the perspective of the consumer i guess in this respect um what's needed to actually give a journey plan with a price for that i think maybe you know we probably need to also think about it from the demand perspective how much demand is there for these three fares how important is it that those are accurately um Reflected in the data relative to obviously the amount of resource you need to put into actually producing this data. Um, does anybody well, else? I, obviously, I'm just keen for our data because a bit like with the, um, I, know, I believe it's changing, but the transit exchange data, if there is any validation errors, then our, all our data gets rejected. So it's kind of a bit of all or nothing. So well, this is, it, um, it is in our data. That's the thing. This is so. obviously something that we need to you know we have six to nine months to address it i guess um you know one obvious solution would be not to submit those files in the short term um, for those types of products um like then yeah. i've got a question of how do i not do that, that that's a question for our suppliers i guess but that's a good question for your it, supplier it, yeah. It, yeah but it isn't I don't think that's an option available to me now. I can not include a line. Well, I don't think I can just choose not to include a specific fare. I could be wrong on that, though. Yeah. So, I mean, you have through fares that are essentially a single ticket that allow you to travel on a route and then travel on a large number of other routes to, to potential destinations, or is it generally a one? Not a large number of routes. No, it's normally one to one or one to two. Okay. It, it, it's something, you know, I don't know what's going to be around the corner as well. I'm sort of trying to think ahead. Yeah, I mean, do we have any other data consumers on the call who have a opinion about this um, type of product? Or any operators that have a similar issue to Simon? Yeah, well, I think in this case, you know, for the former scenarios that you've defined as in first stages operating both directions, I think that's something that needs to be addressed in the export of the data. I don't really think there's a, a good reason to be including the fares on the other direction if there's not any stops, people can't get off on it. Um, so that should be addressed straightforwardly. I think the three fares one is something that probably needs a bit more um, thought. I mean, Tim, as the, uh, the compare, I mean, do you have a position on this? Uh, I, I think we note it simon and um stephen and the team all consider it and um work out how to uh to to address it um in the short and medium term which might have different solutions um, yeah we're not clearly not gonna come up with a resolution today so given that there are other think topics um that you've had comments on Stephen, and we need to address i think that's probably where to leave that one today um but it's noted it's recorded um yeah. and uh and yeah Stephen will come back to it yeah i yeah. think um unfortunately Sam, whatever the solution will be there will be some additional work needed you know whether it's yeah. to remove mm -hmm. the through fares or whether it's to address it in the way I guess I've specified it either way there's going to be some effort involved but yeah let's let's have another conversation and maybe talk talk to Ticketer as well so I'm assuming Ticketer's your supplier yeah, that's yeah. Well. can okay. I just ask one other scenario through fares onto another mode like ferry if that's <laughs> in the data set yeah this is this is a tough one I mean I think you know we had hoped by now that um, non-bus modes might be on odds in a PTI compliant fashion um, I think at this point we're not asking for multimodal fares at all to be submitted. 
Um, and I don't think that is going to change in the short term, um, simply because defining the access rights of something that allows you on a tram or um, a ferry, it, I mean, it, it, in some ways it is possible, because of course you could reference TNDS data or something like that, but that would that would cause a lot of problems in terms of the validation process. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah, so I think that if you've got a service that allows you on a ferry, the, the part that allows you on a ferry should not be published at all. Okay, um, should I move on? Or does anybody else have any? So I had, I had one, one really, really quick thing. But with the passenger types, so we do define the passenger types as in you know we, we use the classes is this are we also supposed to be describing what they mean somewhere that... yeah i mean i'll i will get onto that because there right. is another slide on the feedback session about passenger types um so uh yeah let me just get back to that um okay so first off oh, right okay first stages um as we know a very thorny issue uh, and I'm not going to go away quickly. So pricing. So some of the comments I also had are about the, the what we're asking for in the fair price frame. Um, I've been pretty light touch about what we're specifying. Um, one thing that was specifically called out more than once was, I guess, the absence of a fair table. So we might call that a fair triangle. Um, you know, the profile doesn't mandate that you include um the data points that are required to reconstruct a fair triangle um and also it doesn't define how you might do it if you were doing it voluntarily so i guess the question here is should it be mandatory if you are doing point-to-point -point fairs that have been generated originally from a fair triangle that the ability to recreate that fair triangle is present in the data and then um even if it's not mandatory should we define how it's how it's done um, should we constrain you to a certain way of doing it, um, even if it's on a voluntary basis. Um, are there any kind of opinions on that? I mean, I, my personal situation standing on this is it should not be mandatory. However, I may add a section just defining how a fair triangle um, would be defined in the NetX so it could be recreated. Um, I mean, from a data consumption point of view, and this is really a question aimed at data consumers, is a fair triangle and the ability to create a fair triangle from the data are important. Andy. Uh, to us, no. Uh, I mean, we do actually um, have a, a tool in, in, in inside our system to uh, to generate a, a fair triangle from a NetX uh, from a NetX file. But that doesn't actually go down to the fair table element. We do that from the distance matrix element, the, the pricing elements, essentially, um, because that's the data that we are basing our fair calculations on. Um, to my mind, the, the fair table, as it's been, as we've seen it, is, is a uh, um, uh, is a second representation of that data. So we end up in a two compasses problem as to which one's pointing north. So. OK, that's interesting. Um, and you think that the fair triangles you create without referencing the um, fair tables and the fair price frame, uh, do, do, I mean, are you happy that they're always valid? Yeah, I mean, that's been the main one of the main um, uh, one of the main parts of, of validation that we've given to operators uh, to to be able to upload the NetX file to download the fair triangle as we've produced it and say yeah this uh, this broadly matches what uh, what what um, what we're expecting the the prices to be between all these different fair stages okay thanks Andy um are there any other comments on this Um, yeah, Dave Mountain Transport API. Um, no, it feels it, it, it kind of cuts to the, to the heart of what a lot of this is, which is the uh, what data suits um, data producers versus what suits the consumers. Um, and I think the fair triangle is often something that is more useful from the perspective of um, uh, data producers than consumers. Um, I don't think it makes a lot of 
so many um, use cases from our point of view. So no, I don't think we, there's any, it's mandatory from our point of view to be able to recreate a, a fair triangle from it. Yeah, thanks, David. It's helpful. Um, anybody else? OK, so I mean, I guess given the comments we have heard and I guess given my previous inclination as well, we won't be making that mandatory or it's unlikely we'll make that mandatory. I may still add a section to talk about how you might define a fair triangle in terms of the columns and the rows within the fair table and the cells. Um, but otherwise, it will not be part of the validation process uh, for publication on boards. So one file per product, the file structure. Um, I did touch on this earlier. I think that I guess maybe there's a little bit of confusion about what we mean by a product, because of course a product is not. It can mean lots of different things. Um, so I think the profile is written in such a way, um, or the motivation for it being written in a way is that the preferred approach is that one file per product is how the data is published. Um, this is not the most efficient way of doing things. It's quite verbose, um, but it does simplify things in terms of consumption and monitoring. I think that we do allow for bigger files to be submitted with multiple products, uh, but you know we recommend that that's only done for past type products, network level products. Um, you know you might have a, a you know like um, a city pass and then some district passes. You may put them in the same the same file to be more efficient um, but I think that line specific products um, should always come in their own files um, but what we mean by one file for a product is not that an adult single because of course an adult single can mean lots of different things it can just mean a single product type that's sold for every line what we mean by an ad a product in that context is that an adult single for a specific line and the direction as a fair product that stands on its own um, but different methods of sale and passenger types can be included in the same fair product. So really what I'm saying there is, um, you know, if you've got passes and things like that, uh, you may have a, a differential in price for the medium through which you sell it. And you may obviously have, well, you will have different prices for adults and children and those kind of things. But those are not separate products necessarily. You can include them in the same file. Um, yeah, does that, I mean, does that clear things up for those who were confused about the file structure? Um, there will be additional wording ad added to the profile, but beyond that, I don't think that it needs any further um, adjustments. Um, are there any thoughts on that from anyone on the call? Uh, yeah, Dave Martin, Transport API. From a consumer perspective, that's really useful. Yeah, really helpful. Great. Thanks, David. Uh, yeah, uh, agreed. Uh, that pretty much covers what we thought was the wording, or what we we thought that. Uh, yeah, that I mean, I, 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 I can see I can see where the ambiguity is in the, in the profile at the moment. So I will definitely call that out more specifically. Maybe even put a couple of scenarios in about what constitutes what we mean by product and what we don't mean by product. Okay, so passenger types. We did touch upon this earlier. So and there are a couple of things here. Obviously, the Netex profile has a limited number of allowable values for a user type. So and the profile requires that a user type is declared for every passenger. Um, so these enumerations are quite limited. There's child and young person. Um, and it's been noted that obviously some operators have quite a, a large variety of young person type tickets, you know, under 16, 16 to 19, under 21s, these kind of things, and they can all coexist. Uh, what does this mean in terms of how you define passengers? I think what I will add to the document just to make clear is that you can have multiple user profiles that have the same user type um, so long as you include different IDs and different names to differentiate between them so you if you had say a 16 to 19 and 21 ticket in the same um, situation they would both be they would both have a user type of young person um, but we would expect them to have different names and different IDs to, to separate them out uh, I think going back to Simon's comment, um, you know, where we're dealing with anything that's not just an adult ticket, we are expecting you to put uh, a minimum or maximum age as is appropriate 
to help with the uh, the differentiation between these kind of products. Um, it's unlikely we'll actually validate for that because it'd be very difficult. Um, but we may bring in a validation where if it's a young person or a child, we want at least one of minimum age or maximum age to be present. So that may become part of the validation process. And there's something that needs considering um, when we bring the hard block in. Um, I mean, I guess as a question more aimed at the operators, you know, is this kind of understood and is this um, an issue for you? Simon. Oh, so you mentioned the the minimum maximum age. If it's a group ticket, would it be included? What the, you know, what the. A, a group ticket requires an additional fair structure element that groups all your user profiles together. So you actually have to define each user type that qualifies for a group, and then define what the group is. Right. Um, okay. So is I don't know how that looks on a ticketed UI, but I guess I would expect you to have to define the the constituent parts of a group and what they all mean yeah i think at the moment it just it doesn't exist um we have the classes but i don't believe that there's any way of defining what any of them actually mean so that would be an additional thing that would be need to be added i think right so i mean that's specific to group tickets that actually for normal tickets you do define these passenger types because i know that tickets have said they build the ability for... um i'm aware we define the classes but what that class, we define them as in an adult or young person or whatever, but I wasn't aware that there was uh, any way of defining what a young person was. Right. Okay. Unless, something, so in, unless something new has been added, um, okay. but I'm not aware of. It's possible. So I think this is something that we'll probably need to address with the system suppliers. Um, I mean, I think. Some definition of what these passenger types mean is probably valuable, not only to people presenting things as passenger information, but anybody looking to analyze fares on the network or work on fare simplification or subsidies or anything like that. I think that this kind of data is probably needed. Um, but yeah, I think that's something that obviously needs discussing with the suppliers a bit more because um, my understanding was that the ability to create these definitions had already been created in the UIs that you use, but yeah, so I'm, I'm fairly sure that's not the case. But I could be yeah, wrong. So we'll need to take that away and discuss it. Um, okay, product names. So this is one that you know, this is we're sort of into the the realm of um, process and practice rather than the data profile here. Um, you know the. The Netex profile for BODS does mandate that a name is included, and then it states that that name is a value that's enough for uh, customer facing information. I think what we're finding with a lot of products that we get, um, we're getting names in the style of, as you can see there, CAP, CH, RTN, PUL. I mean, that presumably means something, and it's probably something that's shown to bus drivers or printed on tickets traditionally. Um, but obviously that's not really usable um, for anybody presenting data for a journey plan downstream. Um, so I think the question is more at this point, not um, how can I change the profile? Because I think it's almost impossible to validate that a name is, you know, a, a legible, readable thing for a passenger. You know, how can this be solved? Um, I guess for ticket operators, is this, this is presumably not something that you went to. It's uh, something that's automatically generated, or is it something you put in, Simon? Um, it is something that we that we enter. But um, the reason that they will be things like cap search return pull is because that is the name of the ticket that is presented to the driver on the ticket machine, and that is limited to um, quite a small number of characters. So there's a there's a name of the ticket. There's a longer name that you can give that's printed on the ticket that's also fairly limited, and then there's a, a description that could be, you know, just what the product is. So essentially, what this would be suggesting is that we need another name that would be the public name of the ticket, potentially that has so, more are you saying that would names, allow more characters. Yeah, the names and descriptions are not. We, are they currently being used? And do they contain values that would be yeah, useful so, for a passenger? Well, so so the title of the ticket would be what you've sort of got written there as an example, which would be what the driver would see on the ticket machine. 
um, and it and it's very limited to what they can see. So that's why it's sort of so short and written, written like that. There's a slight you can give a slightly longer label to what's actually printed on the ticket, um, which might be what could be exported instead of the name that's come, currently coming out. Um, but there's an alternative scenario where I guess you say, well, we need another field where we put a full public name in that you'd want on external systems. But that's yeah. why it's not an automatically generated thing. It's just a limitation of the number of characters that we can use. Yeah, I mean, that's understood. I guess obviously that limited number of characters isn't going to change. It's probably there for a reason. But I think if there are other fields that are already being used for printing things on a ticket or descriptions and things, a preferred scenario would be would be to derive it from that rather than insisting that more data is created. That um, said, they're like, also limited. Yeah. It'd be slightly better, but wouldn't necessarily be what you're looking for. But I think, you know, let's That's think about, from the, I mean, from the data consumer's perspective, how much information do you expect in a product name? I mean, I, I would assume that an adult single being included repeatedly, but for different lines, would be sufficient, or do you want additional information? around that ticket name because yeah I, I, you... I, what, what, sorry, I'm not, I know I'm not a, but we do put our, our data into passenger the passenger cloud and in passenger system they take the name and they, they sign well they sign an ID to each ticket type and within their system we can change the publicly facing name manually and then every time we submit a new um, file for our NetX, as long as it's got the same name coming to it from the NetX file from Ticketer, we don't have to keep redefining the public name that's held within the passenger cloud. So that's how their system deals with it. Yeah. Yeah. This was one of the first sort of, um, this is one of the first things that we had to to, to do a work around for, um, uh, to provide a good user experience was to, uh, was to allow uh, an override of the, of the product name as it was, uh, as it was coming out of the uh, the the netx uh, the netx files um, and yeah similar to, uh, to 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 you Stephen we obviously understand as to why it's there um, um, but we also recognise that it needs to be better so we've had to provide a, a workaround for that um, obviously I'm thinking of wider consumers um, uh, they don't want to be doing that and operators don't want to be updating any individually consumer so it is definitely a workaround um uh, okay i mean i think obviously that sounds great from the passenger perspective i mean yeah. you guys want to get to the netex exporting business but um yeah i think at this point i don't really see an easy solution i think that's another thing that we're going to, have to take away and talk to the major system suppliers about how a solution could be put in place but i think at this point it kind of sits outside the profile it's not something that we can deal with in a programmatic sense. I mean, a human being can work out whether it's a um, a decent name or not, but we're not going to be able to create anything that works it out automatically. Um, so that's one I'll just take away and talk to the major system suppliers about. One last one again, which is not something that's really within the profile, but something that's been raised is shadow flares, um, that some of the netex being published on bots include shadow pet flares that are not purchasable by passenger, and therefore are obviously given incorrect prices uh, to people consume the data downstream. Um, I guess the only statement on that is that Shadowfair should never be including the data published on bots. Um, only prices that passengers can pay should ever be included. So I think this is something that probably needs a bit more investigation work on, but I don't think it's something addressable in the profile. Uh, and it's not something that's probably going to be addressable on validation and publication. Again, this is something that can only really be found post fact. Um, and it's probably something only knowable to human beings that are familiar with what prices you should pay and what prices are shadow fares. But I think I just thought I'd include that in this presentation because obviously it was fed back and it is clearly um, a problem um, for the, you know, the the credibility of this fares data. If we're including fed shadow fares, it undermines the whole thing. So um, I think we need to be avoiding that as much as possible. Um, I mean, I don't suppose we have any operators on here that operate shadow fares and think they may be getting into their data or why that might be happening. Uh, 
Steve and Nick from Cornwall. It doesn't know. I mean, I noticed we uh, really Yeah, short. no, Steve and Nick from Cornwall. It will be happening for Cornwall operators because of our bus fares pilot. Right. So they've all got shadow fares, which underpin the reimbursement on the bus fares pilot. And I have had a quick look, and yeah, they're all chucking their shadow fares out into. Yes, that, that would explain. Last year, we did have a, a particularly uh, ambitious student who pointed out that the fares being quoted um, for a certain major operator in Cornwall were just completely out of whack with what he was paying. Um, so I think this is obviously a problem that needs to be addressed. Um, I guess presumably again by the suppliers, um, because. While a shadow, shadow fair obviously has an important use behind the scenes, um, it has no place being presented to a passenger. So I guess we're going to have to take that away and talk about how we can sort that out. Because I think, yeah, like I said, that sits outside this profile, really. It can't be addressed through data structures. Um, I was yeah, going to say, just... well, it can't be something as simple as there's a tag on there to say including bods or not including bods. And you... Yeah, in, I'm just having a, I've actually got a ticket to portal so, open for one of our operators and if you go on the edit ticket type fares tab right at the bottom it says exclude from bods fares export there's a tick box there right so that is literally a process problem yeah probably operators not aware it's there to be honest they're doing All the right, bare that... minimum to push the data out and be functional yeah that's that's good to know I and mean, that's something we obviously need to communicate to operators um i would say that's might... a, yeah, a small yeah, operator well... issue yeah i think when I, when we Publish the documentation, the, the supporting documentation around this profile. I may talk to Ticketer and try and get some kind of advice, you know, a, a how-to guide, I guess, or whatever, as part of that to avoid this this scenario happening. Because, um, yeah, obviously, like I said, it undermines the credibility of the data ultimately. Okay, so I think that was the last one I had. Um, I noticed we're, we're running over time already, anyway. Um, so in terms of feedback, I would encourage everyone who's on this call, whether you're a bus operator or whether you are a data consumer that hasn't already fed back to um, have a read and send emails. I mean, you know, whatever the comments are on, please send them um, and send them to my email address rather than um, marking up a document with comments. Uh, my email address is there. I think it's also on the, the PTIC site. It's on the communications and things. Um, and I've received some good feedback already based, you know, obviously based most of this on that. So. Thank you to everyone who's done it, and you will get individual response when I have time next week. Um, but apart from that, that is me done. Um, does anybody else have any further sort of comments or questions at this point on this profile? No. Okay. Well, let's wrap it up. Um, Thank you everybody for uh, joining um, and I've just realised I'm actually finishing almost exactly on time so that's a rare occurrence. Thank you very much. <laughs>